Hello, I'm Joe Hage, and I'm uh, broadcasting live for WBBA TV here at Life Science Innovation Northwest. I lead the medical devices group on LinkedIn. We are 230,000 members strong as of, as of this recording, and we are the industry's only spam-free curated forum for intellectual conversations with medical device thought leaders like Mr. Tom Clement. He is the chief executive officer for Aqueduct Neurosciences, and I just had the pleasure of hearing him speak for 20 minutes, and I've got a lot of questions, and I'm really happy to be able to introduce him to you today. Hello, Tom. Hi, Joe. Thank you. Uh, nice to be here. I had the pleasure of, of hearing uh, a bit about your company. Tell our studio audience in, in TV land and the world what you're doing. So the company is Aqueduct Neurosciences. We're engaged in the development of products for critical care. And this is uh, areas where people uh, are in hospital beds because they can't manage their own cerebral spinal fluid. So we offer a product, are developing a product that will be on the market in a year or so that will be used temporarily to drain their cerebral spinal fluid, so brain drain. Uh, it's used in the cases where people have a traumatic brain injury, pre and post tumors, infections in their brain, uh, and it's used um, exclusively when neurosurgeons and other surgeons want to manage that pressure inside your head. Okay, well I'll be honest, it's the first time I've heard brain drain in this context. It's usually people leaving a country, um, but we need to get fluids out of the brain. I'm not a scientist, I don't have that particular background. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what types of injuries someone might sustain where that would be a necessary treatment? How big is the yeah. market? Well, the market itself is, uh, in the United States alone, about 250,000 patients a year. In worldwide, it's about a million patients. Uh, for example, Harborview, which is a trauma center here in the Seattle area, they'll place 20 to 30 of these drains on any given weekend. So somebody falls off their bike and bangs up their head and they're getting maybe some blood flow in there that's increasing the pressure. They need to have that relieved very, very quickly before they get sick. Now, I know I'm breaking the rules a little bit here, but I, I kind of play like that. I, I know you don't have it here, but you have an offstage prop. So I'm going to entertain the crowd for a moment. Would you go ahead and get that sure. and show it to us? It'll help us visualize exactly uh, what this technology is and, and what I think is a great innovation that he's added to it. Um, and we'll talk more about that uh, just now. So what have you so, got here? Looking for healthy volunteers. Oh, okay. Maybe unhealthy. You look a little pale yeah, today, I, Joe. I didn't so, plan on this part of the interview, but let's, let's this is, do this. Um, the products as they're currently marketed. They're manufactured by three companies, uh, Medtronic, J&J uh, &J Codman, Integra Life Sciences. They're all basically the same technology. They're all basically 50-year-old technology. What the patient, the patient has their, uh, a catheter in their brain hooked up to this, and uh, by this, this device here is set on an IV stand and is leveled to the patient's ear. And the real problem with the technology today is as soon as that patient moves, even a couple inches, it changes the way their pressure in their head is being drained. And so there has to be a nurse standing by raising this particular catheter, if you will, up and down. So you can only imagine if a patient's otherwise healthy, let's say even pediatrics, children, they're kind of bouncing around and you have a nurse there all the time telling them not to move and when they do move, having to move this. They have to get up and go to the bathroom if they have, you know, for any reason. So we feel like it's time to bring this into you know, modern technology. We've developed a console and a disposable tubing set. The console will monitor the pressures and adjust uh, for the patient as they move. And so now we believe we can get patients up out of bed and move around the hospital and so if they're I, otherwise healthy. Um, as a mature patient, if I had that, would I be instructed, Joe, if you need to shift or you know change the angle of your bed, please press the nurse button first so she can be there for you? Exactly. Current technology requires a nurse to be there to move it. And typically they're watching one nurse per bed to pay attention to these patients. Because if they do move, it can be very serious very quickly. You told a story in the other room about uh, uh, a lawsuit where someone was adjusted. Could you share that? Yeah, without... Um, Don't overshare. Yeah, yeah, and without going into anything confidential there, uh, I'm aware of, I'm sure there's more than one, but I'm aware of a lawsuit, and uh, a friend of mine is an expert witness in the suit, a neurosurgeon, where uh, a patient was not being monitored carefully. They moved up in bed, they overdrained, so they drained more fluid than what they were supposed to and got very, very sick. 
hospitals being sued for millions of dollars because the nurse wasn't paying enough attention. We believe this is, a, again, a situation that can be prevented by adding some safety features and, and active monitoring and adjustments. Um, so I'm trying to visualize it, and, and, and for uh, those who are, are watching us, this will be on a stand, and there will be, will the patient have to touch it? Patient will, will not it touch it? Somehow, I don't know, is there some kind of hydraulic or what? what? No, so our device is it's also passive gravity feed, but it just allows the tube to be um, controlled from the outside so that you control how much flow you get. But basically, think of it like a small box. Um, just put that down. A small box and a cassette tape size uh, device that plugs into it. And then that engages with pressured transducers, flow meters, and controls either how much you're draining or how much or where your pressure is at. What inspired this idea? Are you an engineer by trade? I'm an engineer by personality. Yeah, and sorry training. about that. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm it's enjoying this exchange anyhow. <laughs> it's yeah. a defect. Um, uh, I'm an entrepreneur by training. I got the risk gene. I call it a defect sometimes. I just in, I enjoy the thrill of being out in front. But I'll tell you what inspired us is my one of my partners is a pediatric neurosurgeon who's very frustrated with the technology that he has to deal with daily. And so he, working at the University of Washington, disclosed it to our tech transfer department there, Center for Commercialization. And I was uh, lucky enough to be in the room and see it and said, I want to work with that guy on this problem. It's a, it's a very compelling problem. So you saw this and you said, uh, why don't you just... It actually, you know, Sam, my, my, one of my partners, was a guy who said, we should be able to monitor this and control it. Why can't we do that? He's not an engineer, but uh, certainly, you know, collaborating together, we figured out some nice ways that we think we can do it. So I'm, I'm going to ask you a question that I asked inside, and you answered it very well. I want to share it with, with our viewers. That seems so obvious. This yeah. is 50 year old technology, and you're improving it by not having me endanger myself by moving, which, what am I going to do in a hospital bed but move around a little bit? Feel Why like didn't somebody you. else think of this? How can you patent this? How, how can this even be an opportunity today? Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's an important question, Joe, and you get this all the time. I've been developing medical device all the time, and every one of them, somebody says, how come nobody did that before? And so there's several answers, I think. One is, Sometimes the most obvious stuff isn't obvious till you start working on it. I know when we went out to patent these ideas, we were frankly surprised nobody else had patented anything around it, much less developed anything around it. So um, it hadn't been thought of before. The second thing is that this is frankly for a company like Medtronic or Johnson & Johnson, it's a small product line. It's a relatively small dollar amount. So they're really not inclined to spend their dollars developing products in a smaller market like this. They'd much rather have people on the outside like ourselves develop something, show that it works, take the risk off the table, and then they can acquire it and you know, distribute it, as, which works for me too. As a former director of marketing for a publicly traded medical device company, one of the things that I would hear from customers is, you know, where's the revolution instead of the evolution. It's it's very easy for medical device companies to take their bread and butter thing and add a thing on it. Mm -hmm. And there is a new product. That's exactly what you're doing here. Um, and yet there's a this great opportunity for you that Wow, it seems as though they could adjust, but I guess they don't have the resources at, well, I mean, actually, Medtronic, goodness, they should have, Actually, right? Joe, I would take the position that this is disruptive and it's going to be enough different that um, it really will allow whoever is our partner to stand out when they go to sell into critical care. So I do think it's not just a, a migration, but rather a, a big oh, sea Oh, clearly, in yeah. terms of the impact. Yeah. Um, tell me about that. You, you, you talk about partners, so well, who's your partner? Well, nobody today on paper, but I'm you know, working with and keeping all the three current manufacturers of these devices in the loop. They know what we're doing. We've invited them in. They've seen our technology. I have non-disclosure agreements with several major manufacturers of products for critical care. And uh, I made it well known to them that I would have no intention of creating a sales team. I want them to be my sales team at some point in time. Which would pretty much cannibalize their own sales. How do they feel about that? They'll have to share margin with you, right? Actually, I think they'd be thrilled to replace their current products with something like this because it gets them noted in the hospitals. So you've been in marketing and sales, right? I have. The whole drill is to get in there and to make a sale. And if you have something differentiating yourself from everybody else, that's a new visit, 
and you're in there saying, hey, I've got this great new drain for you, but also while I'm here, you should be looking at these other products that I sell. Okay. Well, I'm thinking Medtronic's having that conversation anyhow. Yeah, but, but somebody's going to end up with a much better product. But, but uh, am I right in assuming that uh, the, the uh, margin for your partner will be lower than the margin that they currently enjoy in their present product? No, we think that we'll make them. Uh, we are actually designing the product to have the same exact margins as they have today. Okay. And so while we think we can command a slightly elevated sales price, we also um, think that we can justify that by the hospital savings that we can introduce. I'm thinking one lawsuit uh, would pretty much... For example. For, for example. example. Or one patient being removed from a critical care bed to a regular hospital bed, thousands of dollars a day. You shared in your presentation, which I thought was excellent, flattery, flattery, um, that the market is pretty much broken up into thirds. Integra with almost a third, Medtronic about a third, and Codman about a third. Correct. You project in 2018 that you may have a third. Is that replacing one of those three? Yes. Is it? Okay. And, and the assumption that goes into that slide and into our projections for our finances is that one of those three become our partner and distribute and frankly replace their current products with this. I'd like to believe that we'll actually do much better than just a third. Okay. We're trying to be conservative in the financials. And uh, your strategy for your company long term, are you looking to create other products that you can bring to one of those three partners, or is this yes. you know, a, a one-shot deal, buy me out, that's my exit strategy, and everybody's happy? Uh, no, frankly, we really have designs on doing much better permanent implants to treat some of these same problems. So what we're doing today is creating products for the temporary situation in critical care, uh, hospital ERs. Uh, but many of these patients end up being transferred into a permanent shunt, implanted shunt. And that technology is equally as, I would say, archaic as, uh, as these temporary drains that you just saw. So we have designs on moving into that space as we, as we mature. So this is new for me, uh, so let me ask on behalf of others who might also not be familiar with the space. There is a more permanent solution to uh, brain drainage. Uh, might, yes. I, so, might I be outpatient and need my brain drained constantly? Yes, there's a and disease. And I have an implant for that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's a disease. It's not a, you know, it's one of those things that's not enormous in terms of population impact, mm -hmm. but it's called hydrocephalus. Water on the brain, you might be familiar with it. From the 50s, you used to see these pictures of kids with downcast eyes and big heads. These are the patients that don't have the ability to reabsorb cerebral spinal fluid from the day they're born. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible situation. It's one in 500 babies. If you get an implant, if, if it's diagnosed correctly, you get an implant, which is under the skin, through the brain, under the skin, and drains the fluid into your belly. The problem is these drains fail unpredictably, but predictably in a certain period of time, but unpredictable. So as they, are, they have an electromagnetic... It's a passive one-way valve. So here's what happens. Your child has a hydrocephalus. They get an implant. Two years later, the, kid, the child has a headache. You don't know if that kid's having a bad day, having a headache, or if the drains fail. Because they happen, 30% of those drains fail within one year, virtually 100% in 10 years. So you're off to the ER. You get a CT scan to diagnose um, she had a headache. if it's failed or not. 20 CT scans on average by the time you're 20. Four brain surgeries on average by the time you're 20. It's a, not a very good situation at all. I'd say. So it, it's also one where financially it's a little bit difficult to develop because it's going to be very expensive. Well, I'm also thinking, I mean, as a parent, if I had a child of that nature, the idea of, you know, it's, headache, let's go to the ER and it, stop everything. You know, and I, I've talked to many, many of these parents, and um, it's, it's heart-wrenching to watch. So I, I talked to one parent whose child had like five implants within the course of six months because they just kept failing, kept failing. Another parent who said they used to love to go to Hawaii, but once they had their, their child with hydrocephalus, they can't go to Hawaii because there's only two neurosurgeons in the whole island, so none of them know about hydrocephalus. So if the shunt fails, they're... So I'm intrigued. I, I, you gave me a visual. I'm a visual guy. I understand the concept for your external um, drainage uh, solution. I am having a hard time visualizing how your concept and your technology externally would translate into an uh, internal thing as well. Yeah, without graphics yeah. to show you, it's a little harder to explain, but basically we are going to add a little electromechanical motor to the valve. 
and we'll add a battery, and we'll add some electronics. I'm assuming parts. you have a patent already because you're sharing this. It's all, it's all been disclosed and patented. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, please so, continue. but our idea is to put the electronics in the smart part in the subclavicle and run a wire up to the valve itself on the skull. And this is very common technology for other things like um, defibrillators and, and heart pacemakers and stuff. Okay. Like that, so. And so, if if among your considered strategies is an exit strategy where one of your partners becomes the partner and they buy this and buy your company, would are you envisioning that you would continue with them and develop the implant as well, or would that be a separate enterprise? I think that's just a discussion we'll have at that time. It's, it could go either way. Yeah. It could go either way. Now, you mentioned that you are uh, fundraising right now, and I know SEC laws and such prohibit you to advertise that or anything, but I think I'm allowed to ask you a question because I don't have $2 million to give you, but I was very intrigued. I'm sorry. Um, but if any of you have money to give me to give him, that'd be great. Um, can you tell me uh, so if I were a qualified, a, accredited investor, yeah. so what would you do with the money at this classic, point? It's a classic situation. We're raising our first round of equity. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe a $2 million equity raise will take us to the FDA, which is a very important milestone for us. It's also the milestone that our corporate potential partners are looking for. They want to know that the product works and they can pass through the regulatory process. They don't really care so much about um, the rest of it because they have all their own regulatory folks and people that will manage it in the long run. So $2 million gets us to the point where we're in the regulatory process. And uh, then at that point we raise another 2 or $3 million that gets us to manufacturing and to the initial clinical work and sales. Uh, so it's, a, it's a classic problem. So we value the company at about $3 million. We raise two, which means we sell off about 40% of the company to new investors. Now, you're a serial entrepreneur. You've played this game before. More than once. And uh, would you mind, uh, if it's not too off topic, give us a little bit of Tom Clements' entrepreneurial history. Have they all been in medical devices? And So, since you asked. Since I asked. <laughs> I developed my first medical device as a graduate student at the University of Washington in 1980, so 34 years ago. Uh, still being sold today by Olympus Corporation. That was in gastroenterology and coagulating bleeding ulcers. I've developed products with, obviously, with, with teammates and, and very clever people for cardiovascular disease, catheters that clean out arteries in the heart, catheters that clean out arteries in the leg. I've helped develop products for monitoring heart rate uh, continuously for seven days. I believe that there will be another gentleman here later today and to talk about that company specifically. Uh, I've raised... Um, you know, for one company, for Pathway Medical, we raised $140 million and developed a whole national sales team. I don't want to do that again. That's why I'm really um, key on this uh, distribution partnership with a major medical company. I'm very intrigued, and I'm sure those who watched our little uh, interview are as well. Um, Thanks, Joe. Do you want to share um, a way that people can get in touch with you? Uh, feel free to contact me. My email is tom.clement13 at gmail.com, or look us up on Aqua neurosciences.com and there's a link there to get me also. Okay. Thanks, uh, this is Joe Hage. I lead the Medical Devices Group on LinkedIn. I'm sure that a number of my members will be very intrigued when I share this interview with them as well. Tom Clement, CEO, Aqueduct Neurosciences, thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you.